Our gracious God, we pray once again, coming not out of mere habit or custom, but asking genuinely from our hearts that you would help us. I need your help as a preacher that I might decrease and Christ would increase. And we need your help as your people that we would have ears to hear, that we would not let these words just go in and go out. We would not be distracted by other things, but you would teach us just what we need to know, and you would speak to us just what we need to hear. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. You are a very special people because I dare say that you could travel all throughout this country, all throughout the hundreds of thousands of churches gathering on this Palm Sunday morning. And you may not find another church that will be preaching from this passage (laughs) on Palm Sunday. You are highly favored. (laughs) Genesis 38 is one of the strangest. And let's just say what it is. One of the most uncomfortable passages in the Bible. I won't say that it's PG-13 or R because it's very different when you see, hear something read with euphemisms than you see something. Sometimes people excuse the sort of things that they watch on TV and movies. Well, the Bible has a lot of sin. Yes, the Bible does have sin, but it's not told in a way that arouses, but it is told in a realistic way. And that's what we have in this passage. And we're going to deal with it. All Scripture is breathed out by God. And this chapter has something to say to us. Our approach is very simple. I'm going to read through the passage as I do sometimes. I'm going to stop every paragraph and we're going to explain what's going on here. And that's going to take some time just to read and stop and explain so we understand what's going on in this strange story And then once we make our way through the passage, we'll pull back and we'll try to understand what lessons, why is this chapter here? Genesis 38, follow along as I read. It happened at that time that Judah went down from his brothers and turned aside to a certain Adulamite, whose name was Hira. There Judah saw the daughter of a certain Canaanite whose name was Shua. He took her and went into her, and she conceived and bore a son, and he called his name Ur. She conceived again and bore a son, and she called his name Onan. Yet again, she bore a son, and she called his name Shelah. Judah was in Chezeb when she bore him. So we we have the marker in verse 1. It's ambiguous. It just says, it happened at that time. So we'll we'll come back at the end to explain why is this here interrupting the well-known story of Joseph, in particular when chapter 37 could move move seamlessly to chapter 39, but here we have chapter 38. So sometime here, meanwhile, in this same window, and actually this covers many, many years because we have Judah going off. He's a single man apparently in chapter 37. Now at some time here, he goes off, he gets married. And as we'll see, it covers maybe 20 years because his kids grow up and they get married. So this is meanwhile, during this whole episode that's going to unfold over many, many years with Joseph, this happens with Judah. And he has three sons, often in Genesis we find three sons. Adam had three sons, Cain, Abel, Seth. Noah, three sons, Shem, Ham, Japheth. Terah had three sons, Abram, Nahor, Haran. And so Judah has three sons by this Canaanite woman. The fact that he married a Canaanite woman is not good. Esau did that. His parents were not happy, but he does it. He marries a Canaanite woman, and he has three sons, Ur, Onan, and Shelah. Verse 6, and Judah took a wife for Ur, his firstborn, and her name was Tamar. But Ur, Judah's firstborn, was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord put him to death. And Judah said to Onan, go into your brother's wife and perform the duty of a brother-in-law to her and raise up offspring for your brother. But Onan 
knew that the offspring would not be his, so whenever he went in to his brother's wife, he would waste the semen on the ground so as not to give offspring to his brother. And what he did was wicked in the sight of the Lord, and he put him to death also. Then Judah said to Tamar, his daughter-in-law, remain a widow in your father's house till Shalem, my son, grows up. For he feared that he would die like his brothers. So Tamar went and remained in her father's house. We don't know what happened to make Ur fall on the wrong side, but whatever he did was wicked, this man named Ur. We've been joking in our family that it's, you know, our, our kids have Bible names, and so we've had a lot of stories of Jacob. We have a Jacob, and then there was a Benjamin, and then an Ur. We don't have an Ur, but we have our three-year-old who will say to us, Ur mean, mommy, Ur mean, daddy. He does, we're trying to get him to say your, but he says Ur, so this is for him. This is his, uh, <laughs> his namesake, Ur. Ur was wicked. It's the first time that we see the Lord striking dead an individual. Now, he was justly angry at the whole world and sent the flood, but this is the first time he strikes dead an individual for his sin. How many times have we seen in Genesis, the firstborn is set aside? Cain, Ishmael, Esau. Well, now the firstborn, Ur. He dies, and so it's the responsibility of the next brother, Onan, to produce an heir. This is called the leverate law. It comes from levir, L-E-V-I-R, which is Latin for brother-in-law. And these marriage laws were very common in the ancient Near East. They'll be codified in Deuteronomy 25. And you can think even up to the time of Jesus in the Gospels, where someone will ask Jesus, well, whose wife will she be in the resurrection because she had this brother and this brother and this brother? It was very common practice that if you die and you have not produced an heir, then it's the requirement of the brother to marry the widow. Now, why do this? Seems very weird to us, but it was to help the deceased brother so that his line would continue. Notice Onan says, this child isn't even really gonna count as my offspring. That's right. It would count for, as the offspring of his deceased brother. So it would be his line continuing. It also would help the family because the family possessions then would stay within the family, and it would also help provide stability and support for the widowed wife, that she doesn't have to remain a widow, but she would have the next in line to marry. And there's something similar going on in the story of Ruth. Remember Boaz? Is there another kinsman redeemer? Is there a closer relative who ought to come and marry Ruth? And he says, no, thanks. And then Boaz is able to do it. So this is a very common practice in the ancient world. Judah doesn't seem to be giving Onan properly as a husband to Tamar. Notice, it just says that Onan is going in and having sexual relations with Tamar. Doesn't even seem to be a proper marriage is what it should have been, but it's not. And notice, this doesn't happen just once, but Onan goes into her repeatedly. And he famously, as the Bible ESV puts it, spills his semen on the floor. He's selfish. He's disobedient. He was willing to have sex with Tamar, but he didn't want to produce an heir. Why? The text tells us because he knew that any sort of offspring produced with Tamar is not really his offspring. There was nothing in it for him. Profoundly selfish. All he wants is to have sex. He doesn't want any of the responsibility. He doesn't want any self-sacrifice. Sounds pretty contemporary in attitudes towards sex. And so he commits coitus interruptus every time he sleeps with Tamar. And to make matters worse, it's, he seems to be fulfilling his duties. As they go behind closed curtains and have relations, it may have seemed to everyone else, well, Onan is sure being a faithful brother-in-law, just like the, the custom would have, but boy, what's wrong with Tamar? She never seems to get pregnant. And little do they know that Onan is committing this horrible act of selfishness, not at all fulfilling his duties, just willing to have sex with Tamar. He knows what's going on. Tamar knows what's going on. And the Lord knows. 
And this was a wicked thing in the sight of the Lord. And so having struck down the firstborn, Ur, he now strikes down the second son, Onan, and this makes Judah very nervous because he has a third son, Shelah. And not to make light of it, but Judah is thinking, wow, every one of my sons who gets with Tamar, something happens and he ends up dead. So I'm not really eager to give the third son to Tamar. And so he says, well, Shelah isn't old enough now. And that may have been true, probably was, and yet it seems as if Judah had no intention of ever really performing the duty he should have done as a father, which was to give the next son in line to Tamar. And so he says, Tamar, you can go be a widow in your father's house. Um, Shayla's not old enough. You know, don't call me, we'll call you. Probably thinking, out of sight, out of mind, go back to your father's house. This whole thing was a mess. We don't have to deal with Tamar anymore. It was a wickedness on the part of Ur, a wickedness on the part of Onan, and now a real sin on the part of Judah as well. But that's not the end of the story. Verse 12. In the course of time, the wife of Judah, Shua's daughter, died. When Judah was comforted, he went up to Timnah to his sheep shearers, he and his friend, Hira, the Adulamite. And when Tamar was told, your father-in-law is going up to Timnah to shear his sheep, she took off her widow's garments and covered herself with a veil, wrapping herself up and sat at the entrance to Inaim, which is on the road to Timnah. For she saw that Shelah was grown up and she had not been given to him in marriage. When Judah saw her, he thought she was a prostitute, for she had covered her face. He turned to her at the roadside and said, come, let me come into you. For he did not know that she was his daughter-in-law. She said, what will you give me that you may come into me? He answered, I will send you a young goat from the flock. And she said, if you give me a pledge until you send it. He said, what pledge shall I give you? She replied, your signet and your cord and your staff that is in your hand. So he gave them to her and went into her and she conceived by him. Then she arose and went away and taking off her veil, she put on the garments of her widowhood. Just when you thought this story could not get any more sordid, it does. Judah fails to do his part as a father. Tamar then decides to take matters into her own hands. We aren't given any sort of divine evaluation of Tamar's actions. Surely, this is not a model for us as Christians. But if anyone is commendable in this story, it's Tamar. She acts boldly, shrewdly, to try to right the wrong that has been done to her. Again, not a model for us. And yet, if anyone has done the right thing, it's Tamar. Notice she waits until Judah's wife dies. She doesn't want to be causing him to commit adultery. She also knows now that his wife has died and his opportunity for intimacy is gone, that he may be looking for fulfillment elsewhere. So when she hears that he's on the road going to pass by where she is, she takes off her mourning clothes. Notice this is years later. She still has widow garments. Apparently, she must wear her widow's garments for the rest of her life or until she's remarried. Everyone knows she's still a widow. But she takes off those garments for a time and she dresses up as a prostitute. Perhaps the veil indicated something in that culture that she was a prostitute, but more importantly, it kept Judah from knowing who she was. And so she stands at the fork in the road, likely some spot in town where it was known that prostitutes would be, and she waits for Judah, who's coming up for the sheep shearing. He's coming up, no doubt, in a festive mood as they would have a great festival to take care of the sheep. This exchange between Judah and Tamar is about as unromantic as you can get. He says, let me come into you. She says, what will you give me? He says, I'll give you a goat from the flock. Of course, he's not traveling with his goats. So she says, okay, before I get the goat, I'm going to need some sort of pledge. I'm going to need some collateral. I'm going to need some proof until the goat comes. And she asks for three things, very shrewd. She says, I want your signet, your cord, and your staff. The signet was probably some sort of personal 
seal, a piece of stone, metal. You might think of in the military a dog tag. There was something like it that indicated his personal seal, his signet. And the cord is probably some kind of chain around his neck that he would wear the signet. So give me the signet, give me the cord, and then, of course, each man has his trusty walking staff, not only to help take on a journey, but to help with the flock. This was a key part of the man's accoutrements. So this is like purposefully requesting, I want you to leave your passport, your voter ID card, and your favorite pair of shoes. (laughs) She's thinking ahead. Everyone's going to know whose these are. Verse 20. When Judah sent the young goat by his friend, the Adulamite, to take back the pledge from the woman's hand, he did not find her. And he asked the man of the place, where is the cult prostitute who is at Enaim at the roadside? And they said, no cult prostitute has been here. So he returned to Judah and said, I have not found her. Also, the men of the place said, no cult prostitute has been here. And Judah replied, let her keep the things as her own or we shall be laughed at. You see, I sent this young goat, and you did not find her. So sometime later, Judah sends his friend, this man, Hira, the Adulamite, with the goat. Remember, he promised a goat. He didn't have a goat. He says, okay, bring, bring her the goat. Go find her. He said, I, 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 we can't find this cult prostitute. It's actually a different word used than prostitute earlier. A cult prostitute was a certain type of prostitute. It was considered even maybe a little higher class prostitute, whether they just get the the words mixed up or she was one or the other or he's trying to put a better spin on it. But we haven't found the prostitute that you're looking for. Of course, she's not dressed up like a prostitute anymore. She's put back on her widow clothes and she's not cult prostitute at the town square. She's simply Tamar, a widow in her father's home. This is all very embarrassing for Judah like leaving your wallet at a strip club and you can't get it back. He just says, ah, okay, forget about it. I can't get this stuff. I don't know where she is. Just, all right, the goat, just let her keep this stuff. Let's pretend this never happened. Somebody grabbing hold of your laptop and finding out what you're really watching on that laptop or where you've really been on your phone. Judah's embarrassed. Yeah, we have new ways to commit sins. We have new ways to sin sexually. We have the same human heart. And it's been the same human heart and the same temptations from since east of Eden. So Judas, ah, boy, forget about it. Let's move on. But of course, he can't. About three months later, verse 24, Judah was told, Tamar, your daughter-in-law, has been immoral. Moreover, she is pregnant by immorality. And Judah said, bring her out and let her be burned. As she was being brought out, she sent word to her father-in-law, by the man to whom these belong, I am pregnant. And she said, please identify whose these are, the signet and the cord and the staff. Then Judah identified them and said, she is more righteous than I, since I did not give her to my son Shelah. And he did not know her again. Like David, many years later, after the sin with Bathsheba and the prophet Nathan comes to him and he tells them the story about the man who had one ewe lamb and the man who had everything and he took from him the one ewe lamb. And David initially is incensed. Oh, how could it be? And then Nathan says, you are that man. Similar here with Judah. Judah has no conception that he just committed sexual immorality or he's shoved that bit of his conscience down. We're very good at that. We can quiet our conscience. We're very quick to see the sins of other people. So he hears his daughter-in-law, what? She committed sexual immorality? How dare she? And she's pregnant? Well, this is a great shame upon the whole family. Let her be brought out in public and we're going to kill her. Let her be burned. Tamar figured something like this might happen. And so, in a very dramatic scene, brought out in public, everyone probably shaking their heads, tisk tisking, oh, embarrassed. 
how could Tamar have done this? Maybe she has a little, a little baby bump starting to show. And very dramatically, she says, father-in-law, I'll tell you who did this to me. And she brings out the signet, the cord, and the staff. Identifies him, and it probably doesn't take long for Judah and probably everyone else. That's my driver's license. It's my passport. My favorite shoes. Everyone can see. And now Judah understands that this was his sin. He should have given Shelah, but he didn't. He hid away Shelah, thinking that he doesn't want his youngest son to die, send Tamar off to just die a widow in her father's house. And now he realizes, and he states in verse 26, she was more righteous than I. Verse 27, here's the conclusion of the matter. When the time of her labor came, there were twins in her womb, and when she was in labor, one put out a hand, and the midwife took and tied a scarlet thread on his hand, saying, this one came out first. But as he drew back his hand, behold, his brother came out, and she said, what a breach you have made for yourself. Therefore, his name was called Perez. Afterward, his brother came out with a scarlet thread on his hand, and his name was called Zerah. Tamar gives birth to twins by way of Judah. Yes, unseemly. By way of her father-in-law, she gives birth to Perez and Zerah. From Perez, the younger, who came out first, will eventually come Boaz. And from that line will come David and Josiah and all the kings. And as you may know, eventually from this same line, from this union of Judah and Tamar, will come Jesus, who is called the Christ. Why is this story here? If you look back at Genesis 37, look at the very last verse, 36. Meanwhile, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard. Turn over to chapter 39, verse 1. Now Joseph had been brought down to Egypt, and Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, the captain of the guard, an Egyptian, had brought, bought him from the Ishmaelites, who had brought him down there. The last verse in chapter 37 and the first verse in chapter 39 are almost identical. You could move from chapter 37 to chapter 39 without anything in chapter 38, and the story would just keep on going. In fact, it's very deliberately set out that way, that, okay, let's go back, loop around, we're back to this right where we left off with the Joseph story. You could go from 37 to 39, skip all of this nasty business in chapter 38. So why is it even here? Do we need this graphic, sinful, uncomfortable, sordid story? Three lessons, three things that Genesis 38 can teach us. Three things God wants to teach us from this sordid story in Genesis 38. Number one, Genesis 38 wants to teach us something about Judah. Something about Judah. This episode probably happened covering a time period that stretches all the way to the end of the Joseph story. Remember, chapter 37, Judah is there. He appears to be single, no family. In chapter 38, by the time we get to the end, he has grown children, and they've been married, and they've died. Years have passed. So roughly some 20 years have perhaps passed, which puts the end of chapter 38 about the time that Joseph is going to be reunited with his family in Egypt. In fact, it may be that the change we see in Judah at the end of chapter 38 leads to the more mature attitude we'll see from Judah during the famine in chapter 43. Maybe these things are happening about the same time. 